Hello, I'm Anthony, and this is a video about all the updates I've made to this Twin Otter aircraft since uh, the previous video back in May. And there have been a lot of updates. I purchased this aircraft uh, from xplane.org. This is the RW Designs Twin Otter. It's very, very good, and uh, both inside and outside. If we have a look at the cockpit, it's uh, fully featured and the uh, cabin's a nice place to be as well. Um, however, it's got some shortcomings and this is where my development work has uh, come into play. Um, the systems were woefully inadequate on the uh, original aircraft and the sounds weren't up to my liking either. So the previous video uh, illustrates all of those improvements which I've done. Uh, so without further ado, I'll uh, take you through uh, what the updates are all about. So one of the major updates is a very interactive one. We've got ground operations. It's an option in the menu which you can switch on and off. Um, at the moment, uh, with the weight and balance, uh, you can add passengers using this menu um, in the seats that you want them to be in. Uh, you can also add fuel um, as you see fit uh, using these icons here. Now the fuel request is different to the previous iteration. Uh, previously you had to add fuel to each individual tank and it always used to start off with 50% fuel in all the tanks. Uh, now it starts off with whatever fuel you had in the tank when you last finished X-Plane. And so far that's uh, not too far away from what's normal. Um, the fuel gets added according to um, how fuel would be loaded into the aircraft uh, via a nozzle. Um, so it will fill up the center tanks first and once those are full then your auxiliary wing tanks would uh, get the remaining fuel. This is not how the ground operations work. So if we switch on ground operations, you get quite a lot more extra interaction. We just switch it on like so, and then when we go on to weight and balance, you see, first of all, we've got interlocks. So you can't load up the aircraft unless the doors open or the hatches are open. So going back to the menu, we can open the hatches quite easily. And the main door to the aircraft, you have to go around to the aft cabin. And now you can open it. Okay, so um, when you come to add baggage, watch your payload in the top left corner. It's gradually rising up. And the other thing is, is that you've got the sound effects of luggage actually being loaded into the compartment. We've got uh, that going on in both direction, in both uh, compartments. And we can also add passengers as we see fit. Good evening. And you've got the sound of passengers coming on board the aircraft and saying hello. Loading up fuel, Good equally, morning. equally interesting. Hello, Captain. We've got the tanker coming up. It'll be here. All soon. right, I got the service request. So if you ignore the Good synthesized morning. voice, um, you've now got a ground handler who's telling you what's happening with the fuel tanker. Um, the synthesized uh, voice is part of X plane. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, you can uh, request a service uh, visit uh, from all of your ground vehicles. Um, it's, it's very limited. You, you have to load up all of the uh, uh, ground vehicles to your location. You can't just simply request the fuel truck individually. I'd like to see you. Okay, that's the tanker hooked up. They'll tell you when the tanker's hooked up, when it's starting to fuel up. Um, they'll tell you when the luggage is loaded and when the uh, uh, passengers are all loaded. So this is all... Okay, we're fueling up now. This is all new okay, stuff. Captain, all the passengers are added. Have a good flight. 
So as you can see, as it's fueling up, I'll the, go and close the, door. The, uh, the fuel is increasing. And you've got co-pilots who will close the door for you. Um, the ground handler will also close up the, um, the forward and aft uh, uh, baggage hatches as well. And you can still hear the sound effects. Okay, of the tanker driver has now finished. You can put the electrics back on. Okay, so you're good to go now. Um, so you're, you're, you've got enough fuel for, for, for the mission at hand. Uh, being uh, filled in through the pipes uh, going into the fuel tanks. What I want to do now is uh, explain how all of these sound effects came to be. Okay, so these voices were a collective effort and I needed some volunteers to come up with the passenger and first officer and ground handling voices. Um, and uh, what I did was I produced a script and here's the script. What this script uh, seeks to do is to try and standardize uh, some of the events so as an example, we've got announcements by the first officer. Um, they will say a, a script which uh, is common to all the flights, but then depending on conditions such as wind speed, um, the first officer will uh, vary between uh, announcing a smooth takeoff or saying that the weather's not going to be particularly safe. Um, and uh, depending on the turbulence, um, they might say that there's, it's worth grabbing a few sick bags, for example. Um, most of the time, you're not going to be operating in this, uh, in this regime of flight unless you're completely mad. Um, but we've also got uh, passengers. They will say your hellos and your goodbyes. Um, and then they will also get uh, other uh, things to say. Uh, depending on context. So for example, if you're still on the ground after the, the last passenger's loaded, um, they'll start getting a bit impatient with you. Um, so for example, uh, remarks like this will be aimed at you, telling you to get a, get a move on. Um, and likewise, they will also complain about whether you, uh, whether they are too hot or too cold. Um, now, the end result of this, uh, now what they gave me were some recordings. And here's one example. Um, it's a continuous piece of recording, which is 1 minute 45. And if we zoom in on this recording and select one and press play. We're about to start up our engines. We'd like to bring to your attention the the lots of small uh, clips like this. So what I'd do is I would uh, copy these clips, put them into new clips, and then I would save that clip. And the result of this was a series of sound files. And what we have is, um, for example, uh, first officer number one, they will give you greetings split up into nine different sound files. So for example, if I go to greetings num number eight, I hope to embark our journey as soon as possible. That's one voice. And if we go to greetings number eight on a second first officer, I hope to embark our journey as soon as possible. Then you get an idea of uh, how much standardization I've been trying to accomplish uh, with different voices. Um, so I end up with this whole um, catalog of uh, sound files for um, uh, all the different events. And what happens is where the magic happens now. So if we go on to FMOD, Okay, so this is uh, FMOD, and this is where all of the sounds are put together and organized in such a way that they can interact with the aircraft, uh, the, the flight simulator. So uh, here we've got one example where passengers are asking to have the temperature adjusted up or down, depending on what the temperature is. So if I press play... Excuse me, Captain, can you turn up the cabin heat up a bit, please? 
So that's one uh, that's that's one remark when the temperature is below the comfortable range. If we take it above the comfortable range, say 39 degrees, do the same uh, example. Excuse me, Captain, can you turn the cabin heat down a bit, please? So you get a different uh, result. And likewise, um, you can change the uh, the passenger which does that. So if I press play. Excuse me, Captain, can you turn the cabin heat down a bit, please? OK, so this is a, a, a random input. So uh, passengers will um, it won't be the same passenger that asks you to uh, adjust the temperature up or down all the time. That's uh, an example on how you can change the speech depending on context. Um, there are other things which are interesting to look at. So, for example, you've got the hydraulic pump here. It's a very short noise. If you go into the uh, uh, flight simulator, the pump lasts a lot longer. So um, what we have is an input for the hydraulic pump here. So if we change that to a value of one and press play again, it stays going until the flight simulator tells you the pump's turned off. So if we just type in zero, um, then your pumps, uh, your hydraulic pump switched off. Then we've got other things here. So we have got uh, passengers, um, passengers uh, loading up and uh, saying hello. And you've got all the other uh, uh, sound effects going on. So for example, if I press play here. Hi. Okay, so that's one passenger. And if we go back to this section again, press play again. Good day. And then again. Good evening. So each passenger has, is typically going to have about eight different greetings that they can give you. And it's a question of chance as to what greeting it is that they give you. Uh, in addition, um, there's uh, a choice of um, sound effects for coming up the steps. And then you've got faffing about at your seat, dealing with your bags, um, dealing with your luggage, um, and then you've got the uh, then you've got the seat belt here. Um, so that was all uh, brought into uh, F mod. I did the recordings for all of the uh, sound effects, and it was uh, much akin to a BBC Radio Four uh, sound effects studio. Um, it um, you just use what you have around the house to uh, get this done and I used a microphone on my iPhone to record all of these things and it was uh, very capable uh, a very capable tool let's go back to the flight simulator now okay so we've got all the passengers loaded up and one of the uh, features I touched upon in the F mod session was that passengers complain about getting too hot and too cold so Temperature, cabin temperature is, it's not something you feel operating the flight simulator, but it, the effects of temperature are things that you can uh, hear and are things that you can see. So as an example, if we go here, the sun's radiation on the earth is equal to about 1.3 kilowatts for every square meter in outer space. And that gets attenuated when it passes through the atmosphere. Um, and how much atmosphere it passes through um, determines uh, the overall uh, quantity of solar radiation you get um, on your aircraft. So it's a function of uh, the sun's angle. Um, so the closer to the horizon you get, uh, the lower the uh, solar radiation you receive. But the aircraft's also emitting radiation as well. So if it's uh, uh, a warm aircraft in a cold uh, ambient air, then it's radiating heat away. Um, you've also got uh, thermal convection. So the skin temperature of the aircraft um, is having heat taken away by uh, convective motion. Um, and that's a function of the speed of the air across that surface. And uh, you've also got uh, conduction of heat from the inside of the cabin 
to the uh, outside skin of the aircraft. Uh, and in addition, each passenger is a source of heat. It's 200 watts per passenger. So um, if you've got uh, 10 passengers, that's two kilowatts of heat inside your cabin without even having any other heat sources. So um, I've incorporated all of that. I'm using uh, uh, this equation here for skin temperature. So we're looking at the difference between cabin and skin temperature here. Um, so that works out your thermal conduction. Uh, we're looking at the amount of solar insulation. Uh, we're looking at black body radiation, which is Stefan Boltzmann, uh, Stefan Boltzmann's equation. Um, and we're looking at the difference between the outside skin temperature of the aircraft and the ambient temperature. And the result can be seen and heard in terms of passengers being um, uh, complaining. Um, and it can also be seen because there's something else we look at. We look at condensation on the windows. And uh, when passengers are inside the aircraft, they're also emitting moisture into the air. Um, so without doing anything else, gradually speaking, um, the dew point uh, raises up. And when the dew point gets to the same temperature as your glass, um, then uh, condensation will form. Uh, so the air saturates and uh, the air can't hold that uh, water vapor anymore. Um, so uh, these uh, win windows will gradually mist up. That has to be managed. Um, you have to manage your, the comfort of your passengers. You have to manage the, uh, the uh, being able to see out of the windscreen. Um, and you can do that by adjusting ventilation. So we have uh, ram air here, um, which is useful. Uh, during um, uh, flight compartment ventilation here and that will give fresh air into the uh, cabin and it comes out through these ducts here. Um, when we're on the ground we can also open the doors and that reduces the um, uh, dupe, that reduces the humidity and the temperature down to ambient temperatures uh, very quickly. Um, so uh, there's a lot which is going into these forts. Um, if you want to actually see what the temperature is, you can go onto the data ref editor. You can go to show data refs, different attributes that we're logging. And as you can see, um, we've got uh, uh, a dew point inside, which is at minus 29 degrees, but it's rising up because of all the uh, humidity that's being emitted. Um, We've got temperature for your bleed air ducts. We've got your skin temperature outside. We've got solar insulation here, which is um, constant. Um, and we've got black body radiation uh, out from the aircraft into the air, uh, environment. Um, and likewise, your cabin temperature is now warmer than your outside air temperature. And that will continue to warm up until we've got equilibrium. That's uh, something which is uh, uh, very interesting. Um, let's switch this on. Let's have a look at other attributes. Uh, one of the other things about uh, the batteries is when you're drawing a heavy load, internal resistance inside your batteries and you've got resistance in your, uh, in your supply cabling. And um, when you have resistance, you've got a re reduction in voltage uh, which depends on the, on the current being drawn. So because uh, motor starters uh, draw a lot of current, 300 amps, uh, what you'll see is the voltage drops for all of your other instruments. So you see dimming. Excuse me, Captain. What's the cause of the delay? Oh, sounds like I'm talking too much. I'm going to talk a little bit more. If I do this, you can see and let go. You can see um, how the uh, the lights will dim. That also applies to your uh, exterior lights as well. So that's uh, a feature of electricity which I wanted to bring in. There's one other feature uh, I wanted to introduce and that was um, damage. So um, if you look at uh, checklists for uh, some propeller aircraft, particularly general aviation aircraft, 
Um, it tells you to switch on the avionics after you've started your engines and connected your generators. And you might ask why. And I asked why. And it's down to um, the basic laws of electromagnetism. When you get a large change in current, you get an induced voltage. So when you switch off your motor starters, once you let go, your current's going from 300 amps to zero instantly, and that creates an induced voltage in your system. And that induced voltage um, is called a surge. And uh, depending on your electronics, some surges can damage the electronics. The opinion I've had is that voltage surge suppression does exist on avionics, but um, there has been widespread discussion that suggests that's not universal. So what I did, um, going back to my script, and what we do is um, we've got a reliability index, and the lower the index number, the more reliable it is. And the higher the index number, uh, the less reliable it is. Um, so for low index numbers above zero, um, you'll have short duration failures um, at long intervals. So you might find a failure which happens for five seconds every three hours, for example. And depending on the equipment, uh, you probably wouldn't even notice. Um, however, for some equipment, like your Navcom radio, if you're using that for your autopilot, um, that can that's enough of a failure to uh, knock out your autopilot, which can cause problems. The other thing I wanted to talk about was wear and tear in general. Let's go on to the maintenance page. This is a new page. Um, I've also introduced uh, general engine wear. And this is literally, it's just simply mechanical wear which happens over the life of the engine. So uh, turboprop PT6 engines, they'll last about 10,000 flying hours. Um, so in order to uh, simulate this, so this is engine wear index, this is the equation I'm using. So it's a function of the existing engine wear index. Um, it's a function of engine power. Um, so if you have your engines idle for 10,000 hours, you're hardly going to pick up anywhere. Um, if you have them at full power, then you'll, you'll be replacing your engines after 10,000 hours, which is about eight years worth of full-time work. So it's not going to happen ordinarily um, very quickly. Um, but it does get accelerated under certain situations. So one of those situations is high engine temperatures. And the higher it, your engine temperature, above its prescribed operating limit. So 99 degrees is the operating limit. Um, if it goes above 99 degrees, um, engine wear starts to accelerate. Yeah. So we've got engine oil temperature here. That's your 90 degrees, that's your nominal limit. Um, if you're up in this region here, 110 degrees, you'll last many years. Um, if you go up to 150 degrees, um, it will be shorter length of time that your engine will last and if you go up to 300 degrees um, you're not going to last very long at all. Looking at engine temperature this is where you get uh, relationships between engine wear and engine temperature and oil quantity and oil filter clogging and this is uh, this is this is quite interesting um, so things can uh, cause positive feedback loops here so um, engine temperature uh, will normally be thermostatically controlled and you'll never exceed the temperature of your engine. So you've got some um, oil coolers uh, on an engine and they will um, be thermostatically controlled. So if your engine's cold, your oil coolers will be bypassed. But if your engine's hot, then your oil coolers will be uh, doing some useful work. Um, we've got uh, clogging. As an engine gets used, there's more fine particles in the oil and those fine particles clog up your oil filters. And the more fil uh, clogging of your filters there is, the less efficient your oil coolers run. And that means your engine is more susceptible to running hot. So it's also dependent on oil quantity. So um, when you go below a minimum level of oil, um, then the engine wear acceleration becomes much, much higher. Um, so 
if you've got no oil at all, um, your engine will be seizing up very, very quickly. So what is oil quantity due to? Uh, oil quantity is a function of uh, the um, amount of engine wear and the how, how, how much power you've put, put in the engine. Um, so when your engine's brand new, there's very little engine wear, which basically means you're, there's very little oil, oil consumption. Um, and the more engine wear you have, the greater your oil consumption. And you interact with that using this uh, menu system. It's only available um, on the ground. You can't fix the en uh, aircraft in the sky. Um, but you've got different uh, wear and tear indices. Um, you've also got uh, wear and tear indices for your avionics, as we talked about previously. And you can fix everything on the ground. Now there's different modes of operation. You can use easy mode. In easy mode, you don't suffer any damage at all. Um, then there's wear and tear mode. And in wear and tear mode, you get all the regular wear and tear, but in between flights, you've got the opportunity to repair everything instantly. And that's fine. But I wanted to have a different mode. I wanted to have an expert mode. And with expert mode, if you have damage and you need to repair it, it's going to cost you. And it doesn't cost you money, but it does cost you time. If you're in expert mode, let's move up here. You get a nice big warning here. If your wear and tear indices on engine, temperature or shaft exceed 5%, then you have no opportunity to bail out and use get go back into easy mode. That is something I think uh, could be an interesting challenge for some people. There are a lot of other changes which I've introduced. Um, what I'm going to do now is a short flight from Kirkwall up to Westray. So we're going to do that very soon. Right, here we are. We are now fully loaded up and we're good to go. So let's get the beacon on. Let's get the fasten seatbelt sign on. We are about to start up our engines. We'd like to bring to your attention the following safety information. Please make sure that your seat belts are now fully fastened. You can use electronic equipment, but please make sure your mobile phones are put into flight safe mode during takeoff and landing. In the event of an emergency, there's two emergency exits at the back, and there's a life jacket under your seat. You will have to adopt the brace position when we announce brace, brace, brace. If we are due to land on water, please don your life jacket over your head and tie at the waist with a double bow. Please don't inflate the life jacket until you're out of the aircraft. We do have your plugs, which will be passing down the aisle now. The aircraft engines are very noisy, so we recommend that you wear them. Okay, engine started. So, let's have a look at the generators. Those on. Let's get the bleed air systems on. We've got the system in manual. Um, we'll just bring it up to the middle, which is fine. Um, uh, we will. We don't need any flight compartment lights. The uh, taxi light is good. So now it's time to uh, take off. So what have we got? 29.12 is the altimeter setting, so let's do that. Oh, right off the scale. Got quite a low pressure system there. Okay, so we have got 21 knots of uh, wind coming from the south at bearing 170 degrees, so we're going to use the short runway today. So it's all fine. Let's uh, bring these avionics on and we will go to EGEW, which is uh, West Ray, so we'll just do that for now. So I quite like the... Uh, 
audible feedback you get here. It just sounds a lot proper. But we're going to fly at an altitude of about 4,000 feet. It's just 24 miles. Right. So, that's that. Let's be on our way. So, props full forward. just reminds me, one of the things I've been thinking of is that I should probably put the windscreen wipers on as well. Let's just put that on. There we go. So one of the things you'll notice here as well is that the, um, uh, is that the, um, Water is a bit more realistic on here now. Um, this is called the Librain plugin, and it's uh, something I've uh, introduced. Um, so I'm uh, quite happy with that. So we're going to have a GPS course. Our base is, uh, what is the power base? 2,200 feet, so that's no problem at all. Um, 2.7 miles though is quite a challenging visibility for uh, a gravel runway strip at West Drake, so we'll see how we can do. Right. Okay, so we've got pneumatic low pressure. Take off. So, have the engine torques. Bear in mind as your as your speed increases. I'll just reduce that desktop audio for yourself. Right, there we go. Okay, and we'll just put the uh, nav on and we'll just put indicated airspeed and altitude uh, capture on. So, not much to see in the Orkney Islands today. It's um, a bit rubbish. It's a bit better in Aberdeenshire though, but this uh, this rain sounds pretty heavy as well. So 21 miles away, so we'll start our descent from 4,000 feet at a, an out a distance of about 12 miles. So we won't stay here for very long. Let's just uh, do a little flyby. So. In real life, Logan Air doesn't use the Twin Otter for this route. They use the Britain Norman uh, uh, Islander, which is a twin engine piston prop uh, with about uh, 10 passengers uh, carrying capacity. So this is uh, quite a large aircraft, but it can certainly uh, handle the runway no problem at all. Okay, so it reckoned we will be there in just over seven minutes. So coming up to the altitude. So 
just going here. So you can see what our progress is like. And now we're uh, accelerating. And there's no rain anymore, which is worthy of parking these now. So we'll just put those in park. And turn them off. We'll also reduce our prop speed as well. Reduce the torque as well, because when you uh, reduce prop speed, you increase torque. Okay, so um, now we are uh, 14 miles away. I'll just set this up. We're going to approach nice and low. I'll also just determine which runway we're going to go on, because we've got quite strong winds from the south. So we've got the, I think I'll land on runway 27, it's a gravel runway, I've got some lights on it, so that will be useful, so we'll just put that there. We'll uh, do a constant speed descent, reduce our engine torque. And then I will put it into heading mode. Okay, so um, this is one of the voice triggers. So when you start descending and you've got your seatbelt light on, um, you'll get an announcement by the first officer. All right, we've got landing lights on. Put the uh, windscreens back on. We'll put some uh, window heat on as well, just in case we get uh, condensation on the way down. We're going to be passing over Papa Westray on the lineup. And you can't see very much. This should be the island of Westray coming up right now. You can just about see a bit of land there. So it's going to be uh, a lot of GPS work to try and figure out where to land. Four miles to go, we'll reduce speed even further, down to 15 PSI. And I'll just bring up the desktop audio. So, can't see very much, there's an island in front of us, and you can just about see the channel. Uh, that's uh, Papa Westray, you can see. So you can just about see some details here. So I'll just uh, put props on full. Okay, so now we're flying manually. We've got this lock here. So after this lock, we'll do a left turn. That's a 10. Down there is Papa West Tray. That's 20 up. So here you can see the runway lights for West Tray now. Crosswind, so we're going to need to crab in a bit.
Turn off the fuel pumps. And let's uh, remove the passengers. a short introduction to uh, the Twin Otter for the second time. Right, hope you've enjoyed that. And uh, see you next time. Goodbye.